Hello, I'm Caleb Colley, pulpit minister here at Lakeside. Thank you for joining us for this live stream. By tuning into this broadcast, you demonstrate your interest in New Testament Christianity, and we're so thankful for that. Perhaps you're considering Lakeside as a possible church home for you and your family. If so, this broadcast is for you. If you'd like to continue your study of New Testament Christianity, then join us for one of our worship services or Bible classes, or email me at calebcolley at lakesidechurchofchrist.com. The live stream is also designed for the benefit of our members who can't be with us due to illness. We are praying for your speedy recovery and return. Please let us know if we can do anything for you. The live stream is not designed to replace God's plan for the assembly of the church. Now open your Bible and let's begin. Thank you, Caleb, and you passed the test. <laughs> Naming all my kids at once, that's no small feat to accomplish. It's, uh, it's said that a young daughter was with her mother at a wedding, and the young girl had questions about what was going on in the ceremony and, and what the purpose of each thing was about. And so she asked her mother, Mom, why is the bride dressed in white? Which was a pretty good question. Most brides dress in white today. And so she had that thought, why, why are they dressed in white? And so the mom thought about it for a second and, and she thought she had a pretty good response. And she said, well, because white is the color of happiness. And today is the happiest day of her life. Well, the little girl thought about it some more, and she looked around, and then she had one more question for her mother. And then she said, well, then why is the man dressed in black? <laughs> I, I want to I back that up with saying that I thoroughly was happy and pleased uh, with our, our wedding and who I married, and it was certainly one of the happiest days of my life. And I enjoyed it. I even cried, and she didn't. Which, uh, <laughs> but we—it's—it's uh, it's amazing, and that just slightly illustrates sometimes how two people maybe can approach the same event, and one be thoroughly happy and excited about it, and the other miserable and and unhappy with what is uh, going on in their life. And I, I believe that sometimes we approach life and approach events and maybe even service in that way. And today we want to figure out how we can enjoy and have joy in serving others. You know, the challenge has stood for the church for, for 2,000 years when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and he told them in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, he challenged them and he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And he issued that challenge to the church and the challenge to us today to find joy in everything we do for the Lord. And I believe that with that challenge, I could have managed it if Paul would have just not put in that one little pesky word, that one word of always. You know, if he would have said, be joyful when times are good, when it's sunshiny days and everything's going right, I could have nailed that. If he would have told me that you just have to be joyful for part of the time, oh, yes, sir, sign me up. I can do that. But when he added that one little word, and it's one of those little words that are so big in our Bibles, when he said, always rejoice. Always, my friends, is a long time. Always covers every circumstance of life. It covers our victories and defeats. It covers love, but it also covers heartache. It covers life, but also death. Success and failure, pleasure and pain, hope and despair. So we ask ourselves and sometimes maybe even ask God is, God, are you sure? 
You sure I, I really have to be rejoicing and joyful always? And the Lord, we might picture responding with saying, yes. When I say always, I mean always. And we respond with saying, Lord, increase my faith. Lord, help me to find joy in all circumstances. Always, again, means that I can't just be happy when things go my way. I can't just be happy and joyful and rejoicing when everything lines up exactly the way I would have it to do. No, according to James, in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into, into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The Bible positively states that it is possible and expected of us and for a Christian to preside in painful circumstances and still possess a joyful spirit. It is possible, and we can do it. Likewise, it is, is equally possible for my lack of joy in my Christian faith to lead me to forsake the grace of God and His blessings. It can be a, a lack of happiness, a lack of, of joy in approaching the work and the service of the Lord if I do that to lead me away from God. It says in Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 through 21, Jesus says, But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word, and immediately he receives it with joy. So a person hears it and they receive it with joy and maybe they even become a Christian and they're, they're excited and they're happy on their new outlook in life. They're excited and happy about their salvation. But he continues up with that in verse 21. And he says, Yet he has no root in himself, for, but endures only for a while. For when the tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And so when we, we think about this joy of, of serving God, Others, we have to realize that, that we, if we're not joyful, can do like this person here. We can re eventually receive the word with joy, but because of tribulation, because of persecution, we might start to fall away. We might start to stumble in our faith. And so we want to pick up this challenge of joy from, from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. We want to accept the challenge in James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 to be joyful always in the Lord. But we all know that as Christians there are, are ups and downs in our faith. There are times when, as the song goes, we are up on the mountain. But the same God who's God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. We know that at just as sure as we're on top of the mountain, that at some point in time there is going to be a valley we also have to cross through in our life. There are going to be those times when, as James says, we're going to go through various trials. We're going to go through temptations, through persecutions, through sufferings. We're going to have to go through hard times as Christians. And so we have to learn to develop that. We know that although we may be walking high on the mountain that sure enough, there is that valley of the shadow of death, as Psalm 23 talks about. And of course, life is easy when you're up on the mountain, but things the thing about mountains is, is they usually take a long time to get up, but they're very quickly easy to get down. I, uh, to, to, illust to, to painfully illustrate that point, I would uh, tell you of a time that my wife and I went to the Smoky Mountains, and we were going there with one of my friends, who uh, visited very often, and, and he was a snowboarder, and he knew how to snowboard. And I thought that was challenging and, and sounded quite joyful. And so I decided to pick that up. And Jennifer and I went, and I got my snowboard, and I got my helmet, and I got that put on, and I started off on the bunny hill, they call it. And the bunny hill was designed for, for us bunnies. Uh, and I fell a lot on the bunny hill. Little children were making me look bad on the bunny hill. But I was determined to go up the mountain and come down in that snowboard. So even though I was not ready for it, I wanted to go. So Jennifer went with me, and I believe she had skis, which was a smarter choice. And we headed up on that ski lift, and boy, was it beautiful. 
the ride up that ski lift with all the snow and watching the people just glide down the mountain so gracefully and easily. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. But then you get to the top and you have to get off. Well, my first mistake was I, I tried to get off. And as soon as I did, I fell flat on my face. And the ski lifts were going over the top of me. And the people at the top were saying, just lay down, lay down. And finally, they were able to get me out from under there, and I, I, I took off. And it was nice. It started off kind of slow, and I'm coming down the mountain, and I'm starting to pick up speed. And, and I'm thinking, I'm getting really fast, and I'm, I'm going pretty quick. And I, here I go. I'm passing everybody down the mountain. And uh, there's a turn as you come down, and you head back, back towards uh, the, the ski house there, the lodge. And, and you turn, and you come back around it, and, and I make the turn. And I'm thinking, I'm going good, but that ski lodge kept getting larger and larger. And I'm thinking, how am I going to stop? On the bunny hill, I stopped by falling over. And uh, so that's what I did. I thought, I've got to stop, and my only option is just to lay down. And so I did, and I tumbled. And I imagine it looked like a helicopter, that snowboard flying through the air. And that trip down the mountain was painful painful down the mountain and that's that's kind of sometimes how our our life is we we are high up on the mountain we come to the worship services we get encouraged we get uplifted we feel great we get out into the week and we experience trials and, and life comes back into focus and and we we start to maybe have times where we're questioning our things we're questioning ourselves we're questioning our faith and and we see that that there are those times when, when I may be up on the mountain, but I know, I just know that there's some kind of trial ahead, and maybe I'm, I'm even apprehensive about being too joyful on the mountain, expecting something to go wrong. May I suggest to you in, in all of this, in, in, in discovering how to have joy, in, and specifically having joy in, in service and serving others, May I suggest that maybe we, first of all, have the wrong definition of service. We have the wrong definition of coming down off the mountain. We need to be a people of joy, but let's get that definition right. You may have the wrong definition of joy, but it's okay because I think most of the world has the wrong definition. In fact, Merriam-Webster, and I found this on Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, has this to say about joy. Joy is the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. And, and to the world, that's joy. When things are well, when things are successful, when life is good and has brought you good fortune, or you are just having a good look out on life, you, you have the prospect of, of prospering, and that's joy. Oh yeah, I can be happy. I can be happy in that, but that is not true joy. That is not the true joy that we are seeking. No, we are seeking something that, that lasts past the moment. Past the moment where you're being successful. Past the moment where you're experiencing well-being or good fortune. It happens even during those times of trial, the Bible, Bible tells us. And so that is what we're looking for. See, the world's definition of joy is synonymous with the definition, we might say, of happiness. You see, both of these are emotions and are dependent upon what happens to me. And see, that's the difference between what we're talking about and the joy of serving. Because when I am serving, it's not about me anymore. It's not about what happens to me, but what I am providing for someone else. And the focus stops being about me and my needs and my fortune and my success, and it becomes about the needs, the fortune, and the success of those who are around me. You see, when we are serving, that is when we are most joyful. Because it's not about me anymore in this. We need to realize that joy here is a gift from God. Joy, in fact, as we're told in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, is a fruit of the Spirit. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is a gift 
from God to us, His creation. You see, God expected and wants us to be joyful. He expects us to be happy in all, all circumstances. But even Jesus said in John 15 and verse 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. God wants us to be joyful. He wants us to be happy. But we have to have the right understanding of joy. We have to mean that that doesn't always mean I'm going to have success or good fortune or well-being. But that God wants that. We can come to the Lord, as it says in Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. We can come and make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's what we've done this morning. We've come, regardless of circumstances, because some of us have entered into this building this morning having success. Some of us are experiencing failures. Some of us have recently celebrated life, but maybe some of us have went through the suffering of death and experienced that in our families. Some of us are on the mountain and some of us are in the valleys, but we can all come together in one place and make a joyful noise to the Lord, as it says in Psalm 100. And all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. God wants me to have joy and to be happy in this life, but I have to understand His purpose and His definition for joy, True joy is not found in obsessing over earthly possessions. It's not found in obsessing over this world and success or failures. It is a gift of God. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. One area that we find this in, as we mentioned, is in the joy of serving. And again, serving is not about me. You remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, that we are have the mindset of Christ? In that we are not to be concerned with our, our own needs, but also with the needs of others. And if I were to, to have a, a list of priorities from Philippians chapter 2, if I was have to have a list of whose needs I need to be concerned with in that, my first, first on my list would be God. Jesus Christ, God, is the top of the list. We seek His kingdom first and His righteousness. We put God first. But if I found a second in there, it wouldn't be me. No, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, second on the list is everyone else around you. Not concerned with your own interests, but also with the interests of others. And when I take that focus on myself, when I'm not making it about myself, but I'm putting that time and energy and focus on helping others and fulfilling their needs, then that helps me. It's not all about me. It also helps me to fulfill my created purpose. You see, you were created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, for good works. You were created for service in Christ Jesus. Even Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, Jesus said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. And so Jesus, the Hebrew writer, tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, or 12 and verse 2, He tells us that even the Lord Jesus approached the cross with joy. And during the cross, despising the shame... Why? Because he wasn't doing it for himself. He was doing it for everyone else. That cross isn't about Jesus' needs. It's not about his wants or his, his, his desires even. It's, it's about us. It's about our salvation. It's about delivering us from a life of sin. I fulfill that created purpose in Christ Jesus. Even we think all the way back to the book of Genesis, in, in, in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 specifically, when God created Adam, He created him and put him to work. He says, Adam, you name the animals. Adam, you tend the garden that I have created. All the way back at the beginning, we were created to serve. We were created to work. And when God formed relationships there, 
in Genesis chapter 2, and, and he brought man and woman together. They were to be one. And he says specifically when he made that relationship that she was to be a help meet for him. In that she was not to focus on herself, but the needs of her husband. And the husband likewise, giving honor to the weaker vessel and giving honor to the woman. He is to focus on her and not on his own needs. And that includes in the intimacy in the relationship as well. We learned from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's not about my needs, but the needs of my spouse. We were created for a purpose. We were created to serve one another. And I can have joy when I know I'm doing that. When you're serving others, you can know that you're doing exactly what God wants you to be doing in that moment. You can know that you are doing the Lord's work. And that should bring you so much joy that you're filling in and helping someone's need. We also understand this, that, that the greater blessing is found in giving, not receiving. And I understand that from what Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. When he looked at the elders from Ephesus and he reminded them what the Lord Jesus had said, when he said that, is, that is a, it is, the man is more blessed who gives than receives. And what I understand is that the greater blessing in all this is the one who is giving, not the one who is receiving. And so I am, I am part of that greater blessing. I receive this blessing in, in what God has given me and what I am sharing with others. I am able to share in that blessing. I am able to, to work out what God has worked into my life. And it's just as was mentioned, we think about 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 when we talk about our giving. It was mentioned earlier. We give out of what we have been given. Even Paul said there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that you give, it's, it's according to what a man has and not according to what he doesn't have. And from that I understand that if I have nothing, if I've received nothing from the Lord, then I'm not expected to give anything. It's as a person, it's as, as they purpose in their heart, and they are to be cheerful givers of what they have received. You see, when I give back on the first day of the week, I am giving out of what I have been given. And it's the same when it comes to service and to work in the church. I am working out what God has worked in. Now, there's many ways that God works into my life. The first and foremost, we might say, is through the Word. You see, in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We have that valuable Word of God. And he tells us that that Word thoroughly equips us for every good work. You see, when I read the Bible, God is equipping me for good works. When I read and understand the Word of God and I see it, He's equipping me for the work that I need to go out and do. I learn of the good works. I am, I am encouraged to do those good works through the Word of God. But if I am a hearer and never a doer of the Word then I'm not working out what God is working in. The Bible tells us that God is, is continually working in us, working to improve us, working to make us complete unto every good work. And so we have to work out those things in fear, work out our own salvation, but work out what God is working in to our lives. We see God working into our lives also in 1 Peter chapter 4 which was read for us in verses 10 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11 tells me that if I have a God-given ability, God expects me to use that to minister to another. The word minister there is simply to serve, not to necessarily be a minister or a preacher, but to be a servant in the church. So as you therefore have ability that has been given to you by God, you are expected to serve one another. And that applies to everybody. You see, each and every person has God-given abilities that allow them to be able to serve another person. You have abilities and talents that I don't have. There are needs that you can better meet in this congregation than I myself can meet. 
and you have abilities and gifts and talents from God that equips you for doing that work. And so if you have that ability, if God has, has worked in that ability into your creation, into you as a person, you are expected to use that to minister to one another. As everyone has that ability, minister it to one another. And so you can have joy in knowing that you are working out what God is working in. But we have to stop and ask the question. It's, it's just like I go back to that giving there in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. I go back to that. And I reflect on it. And as it tells me there in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, that when I'm giving cheerfully, he, he goes on there towards the end, of the end of the text, saying that God is the one who provides the seed to the sower. Would I expect God to continue to give to me if I'm not giving out of what He has given me? Do I expect God to continue to put seed into my sack when I don't ever take any seed out of my sack? God loves, the Bible says, God loves a cheerful giver. And think about it also with your abilities. With everything that God's working in through you, whether it's through the Word, whether it's your natural talents and abilities that God has blessed you with, why would God continue to work into someone who is not working anything out? You know, I, I, I reminded myself of, of, of Psalm 23 again where he says, my cup runs over. And that, in that sense, it was a good thing. He was being blessed from God. But sometimes I wonder if our cups aren't running over because it's all inflow and no outflow. Maybe we should empty the cup every once in a while and use what God has worked into my life with the abilities that he's, he's taught me and, and made me mature in the scriptures or with the natural abilities that I have. Why would God continue to work in what I am not willing to work out. One of the most peaceful times in my life is when I have put in a hard day's work. When, when I work hard and, and I go home at night, that is when I am peaceful because I know I have put in everything I have. I have put in everything I've got and I'm at peace and I find joy and pleasure in that. Folks, there are a lot of things in this world that's going to be pulling for your happiness, your joy, but only those things that are of the Lord can truly bring joy in your life. There is joy in serving others because it's not about what happens to me anymore. It's about me looking and helping other people. I am fulfilling my created purpose. Jesus created me. God created me in Christ Jesus for good works. I am receiving the greater blessing in this. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I am working out what God is working in and the abilities that He has supplied for me. Folks, that is true joy when we fulfill those things and we give back to God and what He has worked in us. We have the joy of serving others. You have the joy and the opportunity today to obey the gospel, to be forgiven of your sins. You have the joyful opportunity to start your walk with Christ today if you need be, to get you on the right path. This morning, if you have not obeyed the gospel, if you have not been baptized by faith for the forgiveness of your sins, we would encourage you as a congregation, as a church, to do so before it's everlasting too late. I promise you, if you live faithfully to God, you will experience no greater joy in this life than being a faithful child of God, working and serving each and every one to the joy and glory of God. If you have any need this morning, won't you come as together we stand as we sing. I have decided to follow.